wisdom. The final frontier to true knowledge. Welcome to Wisdom Trek, where our mission is to create a legacy of wisdom, to seek out discernment and insights, to boldly grow where few have chosen to grow before. Hello, my friend. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, your captain on our journey to increase wisdom and create a living legacy. Thank you for joining us today as we explore wisdom on our second millennium of podcast. This is day 1,251 of our trek, and it is Worldview Wednesday. Creating a biblical worldview is important in order to have a proper perspective on today's current events. To establish a biblical worldview, it is required that we also have a proper understanding of God and His Word. Our focus for the next several months on Worldview Wednesday is mastering the Bible through a series of brief insights. These insights are extracted from a book by the same title from one of today's most prominent Hebrew scholars, Dr. Michael S. Heiser. This book is a collection of insights designed to help you to understand the Bible better. When we let the Bible be what it is, we can understand it as the original readers did and as the original writers intended. Each week we will explore two additional insights. Today is Mastering the Bible, the Known World. So Insight 11, the world known to the biblical writers was a lot smaller than ours. Genesis 10 is known to Bible scholars as the Table of Nations. This chapter is a biblical example of what happened in the centuries after Noah and his family disembarked the ark, having survived the flood. The Table of Nations describes how the descendants of Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, repopulated the earth, forming the nations known in the rest of the Old Testament story. In terms of this unfolding narrative of Genesis, the chapter is a precursor to the Tower of Babel story found in Genesis chapter 11 verses 1 through 9, and that is where the nations were divided and dispersed by God. There is an obvious problem with the Table of Nations, or for those who let the Bible be what it is, an obvious disconnect between the world of the biblical writers and the world that we know today. The Table of Nations shows no knowledge whatsoever of the geography belonging to North America, South America, Australia, China, India, and Scandinavia. The same is true of the knowledge of Earth's geography in the New Testament, found in Acts chapter 2. The known world in biblical times covered a fraction of the size of the globe that we know today. This is no surprise if we let the Bible be what it is. The biblical world is composed of 70 nations that are situated in what we now call the Near East or the modern Middle East on the land masses that surround the Mediterranean Sea. There is no hint in the scripture of a landmass beyond that region. We can learn a lesson from other misguided attempts to make the Bible into something that it isn't with respect to the true size of the world. Once Europeans achieved the ability to cross the Atlantic and circumnavigate the world, people immediately question where these other countries and peoples came from. Most Europeans, well familiar with the Bible, presume that these people must have come from Adam, but how did the descendants of Noah produce these people? All sorts of strange proposals were offered to answer these questions. Those efforts, in turn, produced theories of race or cultures, including the theory that non-Europeans or non-white races came from subhumans or humans separated from and inferior to Adam. The rest is history. Europeans believe that embracing these explanations, which are inherently flawed and racist, was necessary to preserve biblical authority. Despite the absence in the Table of Nations, the Bible had to speak to the discoveries of these new lands and peoples. These interpretive gymnastics institutionalize racial ideas that the Bible never endorses. And now let's move on to the next insight, insight number 12, Biblical writers believe that God made the world they knew, not the world that they didn't know. The biblical writers didn't know anything about a lot of things that we know today. That's especially true when it comes to areas like medicine, engineering, and science. Today, many Christians want to make the Bible a source of science due to the perceived threat of evolution. Other Bible believers try to force certain passages into teaching evolutionary theory. But the biblical writers had no concepts of these theories which were formulated in the 19th centuries. Both approaches are flawed and don't allow the Bible to be what it is. The biblical authors were pre-modern and, therefore, pre-scientific in the modern sense. The Bible itself informs us of this in some transparent ways. 
For example, ancient Israelites believed the seat of the emotions and and decision-making was the internal organs such as the heart, intestines, and kidneys, which were listed in several passages. We also use this language today metaphorically because we know that the emotions are brain-based. The biblical Hebrew doesn't even have a word for brain. Hebrews chapter 7 verses 4 through 10 mentions that the descendants of Levi existed in the loins of Abraham. We know from modern science that a person's full genetic results from conception, and therefore an insight into procreation that the authors of Hebrew would have had no concept. Biblical cosmetology is also pre-scientific. For example, many interpreters see the Old Testament passage as a three-tiered universe, the heaven above, the earth beneath, and the waters under the earth. And this can be found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 4, Philippians chapter 2, verse 10, and Revelations chapter 5, verse 3. This perspective would have been common throughout the ancient Near East and Mediterranean. The biblical writers had no intention or ability to teach modern science in Genesis or in any other passage. They put forth ideas that transcends the facts of biology, chemistry, physics, and any other hard science. God created the world and everything in it. This assertion does not contradict science, though many scientists want to resist it. God, in his wisdom, gave us a truth proposition that surpasses scientific theories and debates. Let critics deride the Bible for not being what it wasn't intended to be. They will sound hopelessly foolish. And we can see this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 19. For the wisdom of the world is foolishness to God. As the scripture says, He traps the wise in snares of their own cleverness. And that will conclude this week's lesson on another two insights from Dr. Heiser's book, Mastering the Bible. Next Worldview Wednesday, we will continue with two additional insights. I believe that you'll find each Worldview Wednesday an interesting topic to consider as we build our biblical worldview. Tomorrow, we will continue with our three-minute humor nugget that will provide you with a bit of cheer, which will help you to lighten up and live a rich and satisfying life. So encourage your friends and family to join us and then come along with us tomorrow for another day of Wisdom Trek, Creating a Legacy. If you'd like to listen to any of the past 1,250 treks or read the Wisdom Journals, they are all available at wisdom-trek.com. And I encourage you to subscribe to Wisdom Trek on your favorite podcast player so that each day's trek will be downloaded to you automatically. And thank you so much for allowing me to be your guide, your mentor, but most importantly, I am your friend, as I serve you through the Wisdom Trek podcast and journal each day. And as we take this trek of life together, let us always live abundantly, love unconditionally, listen intentionally, learn continuously, lend to others generously, lead with integrity, and then leave a living legacy each day. I am Guthrie Chamberlain reminding you to keep moving forward, enjoy your journey, and then create a great day every day. See you tomorrow.